Hello and welcome to the track Application Identity, securing your app with Amazon Cognito. My name is Andrew Hooker and I'm a Senior Solutions Architect with Amazon Web Services in Melbourne, Australia. It's my pleasure to be providing this content for you today, so let's jump right on in. Today I'm going to take you through a number of different topics which cover application identity. Firstly, we'll meet James and Mira, the software developer and the security architect who have a challenge with application identity. We'll then briefly cover identity standards, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect and review common authorization flows. Now, to assist with the implementation of these standards, I'll provide an overview of Amazon Cognito, challenges our customers are facing and how it can solve complex identity challenges. We'll then jump into how can we identify the actors from these open standards within the high level architecture defined by James and Mira. Then a demo into Amazon Cognito user pools where we'll create compliant OAuth 2 endpoints. And then to wrap up, we'll demonstrate integrating Amazon Cognito with common technology services, application load balancer and containers as per James's requirements and validate these requests being made for a set of resources. Now, just to call out, for this particular track, you will need to have existing knowledge of application identity, common AWS services, and API design working with Node.js and the Express framework. So, why do we need application identity? Let's meet our software developer, James, and our security architect, Mira. These are two common personas that you may see and work with every single day. Let's have a look at their common challenge with application identity, see what they have to say, and track their conversation. Here we have our software developer, James, and our security architect, Mira. Now, James is looking to design and build a new app. He's requesting consultation from our security architect, Mira. James is really interested in getting his idea for the new app out. However, Mira is curious to understand whether James is using trusted industry protocols in OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect to ensure his app is secure. James isn't familiar with these open standards, so let's dive a little bit deeper into them to give some more understanding. So, as you can see, these particular personas are going through common issues that you may have with application identity. So let's jump right into these standards to get a better understanding. OpenID Connect 1 is a simple identity layer on top of the OAuth 2 protocol. It allows clients to verify the identity of the end users based on authentication performed by an authorization server, as well as to obtain basic profile information about the end user in a REST-like manner. OpenID Connect, or OIDC for short, allows clients of all types, including web-based, mobile, and JavaScript clients to request and receive information about authenticated sessions and end users. Now, the specification suite is quite extensible, allowing participants to use optional features such as encryption of identity data, discovery of OpenID providers and session management when it makes sense for them. The OAuth 2 protocol has a number of different authorization flows. Now, depending on the makeup of your design and the entities that are interacting with your application, there will always be an option to choose. So let's introduce these to help us understand where best to use them. Firstly, we have the resource owner. This is an entity that can grant access to a protected resource. Typically, this is the end user. Secondly, we have the client. This is typically an application requesting access to a protected resource on behalf of the resource owner. Thirdly, we have the resource server. This is the server hosting the protected resources. This is typically an API that can be accessed. And finally, we have the authorization server. This is the server that authenticates the resource owner and issues tokens after being provided authorization. Now, next we have the OAuth 2 flows. Let's go through these to see where it's best to use them and for what use case. First up on the list, we have client credentials. This is used for machine to machine authorization. No end user authorization is required with this flow. An example of this could be a simple scheduled script invoking an API. Next, we have authorization code grant flow. What if your client is a regular web application executing on a server? Then this is a flow that can be used. What if you're developing your presentation layer as an SPA? Then explore the use of authorization code grant flow, PIXIE or PKCE, which stands for proof key for code exchange. Now, this is to prevent cross-site request forgery and authorization code injection attacks during the flow. Now, alternatively, if your application doesn't require an access token for the resource server, 
then you can explore the use of implicit grant flows, which is slightly less secure. And finally, if your client is 100% trusted and the authorization co-grant flow cannot be used, then explore the use of the resource owner password flow. Now, there has to be a secure approach for the transmission of this data. The transfer is done between a small number of OAuth2 actors and it's done via the use of JSON Web Tokens or JWT for short. This access and ID information is encapsulated within the JWT, which is an open standard that defines a method for secure transmission between actors as a traditional JSON object, which we're all familiar with. This information can be verified and trusted as it's digitally signed using a secret or a public and private key pair. Now, finally, to ensure that our resource servers can only be accessed by authorized clients or users, scopes can be introduced within the JWT. This is a mechanism as a part of OAuth2 where OpenID clients can specify what access privileges are being requested for the access tokens. To help us understand this a little bit further, let's look at the authorization co-grant flow sequence. Here are the actors associated with the authorization co-grant flow, the client, the authorization server, the resource owner, and the resource server. Firstly, the user may click a login button, for example, within a regular web application, where in turn, the web application requests authorization from the authorization server by hitting the authorized endpoint. The authorization server will then redirect the user to the login and provide verification of consent by listing permissions if it's required. Once authenticated, the authorization server redirects the user back to the application with an authorization code. This authorization code is then sent to the authorization server via the OAuth2 slash token endpoint, typically along with the application's client ID and the client secret. The authorization server will then verify the code, the client ID and the client secret combination. And if it's valid, then the authorization server will respond with an ID token and access token and optionally a refresh token. The client application can now use the access token to call the API to access information depending on the pre-authorized scopes that are defined. And finally, if authorization is granted, the API responds with requested data to the client. Let us lean in on our personas conversation again. Now that we have a better understanding of these industry standards and how they can help James with his application design, where do you think he should start? Should he develop all this from scratch? I don't think so. With the use of Trusted Identity and Access Management Service, or IDAM for short, this can then help developers build secure applications quickly and efficiently, and ultimately help mirror sleep at night knowing that hosted applications are using best practices. Let's dive into Amazon Cognito, which Mira has suggested to understand how it can solve the application identity problem. Firstly, what do customers really want to focus on when developing applications? And what are they telling us? They would like to focus on differentiating features in their applications to get the competitive edge. They would also like to provide flexible, modern applications for authenticating for their users. They'd like to build standards-based, API-driven platforms for the future and ultimately protect the security and privacy of their customers. Secondly, what challenges are our customers facing when developing new applications? Implementing identity from scratch is challenging to build and operate. There are a multitude of options which result in integration and understand and code and build. Developing to standards such as OIDC, OAuth2 and SAML can be quite difficult. And that their applications operate in an increasingly hostile landscape. So, how can Amazon Cognito help? It's a simple and secure user authentication and authorization control service for modern applications. It's the application identity Swiss army knife. It can offload undifferentiated heavy lifting for developers. It can act as a normalizing layer for your applications where you get the choice of existing or cloud native identities. It can then standard tokens with out of the box implementation for industry standards for authentication and authorization and provide advanced security options for your apps and for your users. What else does Amazon Cognito provide? 
It's very extensible with the ability to provide out of the box integration with native AWS services such as AWS Lambda, API Gateway and application load balancers. It can provide end user authentication authorization with granular APIs and SDKs across multiple languages and frameworks which are commonly used today. Amazon Cognito also provides a fully managed service for hosted UI capabilities, which is customizable. This provides pre-built pages for common functionality such as sign up or sign in or forgot password flows, which we're all familiar with. It also provides out of the box support for open standards, which we've previously touched on, including SAML or security assertion markup language, which we hadn't previously covered and provides implementation support for social federation. In addition, Amazon Cognito has advanced security features such as compromised password database and adaptive authentication to block suspicious sign-in attempts uh, and or to add second factor authentication in response to an increased risk level. So let's jump back in and observe the conversation again with James and Mira. With the introduction of Cognito and the learnings taken on the open standards, James is feeling much more confident in his implementation journey. However, he would like to know how it can be done effectively with Amazon Cognito. To help us best understand the implementation of Amazon Cognito with James's application, let's look into a high level architecture to see how we can integrate these flows and identify the actors we've previously introduced. Below you can see the current high level architecture which has been identified by James and his development team. This is just a typical N-tier application architecture, which you're likely familiar with. Here you can see though, the initial two layers have been defined. James and the team have also decided to work with containers for application level hosting. So the resources will be hosted on AWS Elastic Container Service and will be fronted by an application load balancer. All the data will be surfaced from the individual data stores that correspond to the relevant APIs that are hosted on ECS. So, to help James get started, let's identify the OAuth2 actors as a part of this architecture, which are needed for the authorization flow required on this app. Firstly, we have the client, which is acting as a web app, making the request to the APIs within the application layer. The user is making initial contact to the app, as you can see, and would like to authenticate to gain access. This is where Amazon Cognito can help to act as the authorization server and assist with the authentication and authorization using the authorization code grant flow. Thirdly, we have the resource owner, which in this case is the user. It's interacting with the application. And finally, we have the resource server, which is the individual APIs and which are servicing the data for these particular users. So now that we have the high level architecture defined and understand the actors and the authorization flow required, Let's dive a little bit deeper into Amazon Cognito user pools to create the services for compliant OAuth2 endpoints. Firstly, we will create the user pool, which will provide the ability to start using the APIs directly from the SDK or the CLI. Now, at this point, only API calls such as sign up and initiate auth are available. To ensure we can access OAuth2 endpoints for the user pool, we will need to add a domain. You can either add a full custom domain, for example, like auth.enterprise.com or utilize an existing Cognito domain with a unique subdomain, which maps back to the user pool. Once the domain is available, there is now an OpenID Connect server with OAuth2 endpoints. This includes access to the well-known configuration endpoint and a hosted UI ready for access. To customize the required OAuth2 behavior, and start invoking the endpoints, you will need to create an app client. Now that the app client is ready, we will be able to invoke the OAuth2 slash authorize endpoint, which starts the authorization code grant flow we called out earlier. During the authorization flow, the authorization server will invoke the user pool to add and link any users where required directly. Now, let's look at the sequence flow for Cognito user pools as an OpenID provider we will go through the full authorization code grant flow to give you an idea of what is taking place behind the scenes. Let's jump in and take a look. Here we can see a number of additional actors as a part of the authorization code grant flow. These are here to further help detail its use with Cognito user pools and when federating with social IDPs such as Google or Facebook. So 
Firstly, the flow starts by sending a request to the authorised endpoint provided by the auth server. Secondly, the auth server will attempt to verify the request and if it's valid, launch the sign-in page which is a part of the hosted UI provided by the user pool. The hosted UI will be presented for the user and an external IDP will need to be selected to sign in against. This sign-in request is then routed to the IDP selected and an authentication then takes place. Once it's authenticated, the IDP will respond with the authorization code to the authorization server. Now, at this point, the authorization server will request an access token from the relevant IDP and subsequently, the JWT access token is provided for the authorization server. The authorization server will then talk directly to Amazon Cognito user pool and update the profile of the user and subsequently create or link the user. Once this has been completed, the original auth code will be returned to the client, where the client can now request the access token from the authorization server to commence access to the resources. Now let's configure the authorization code grant flow in Cognito user pools to help James and Mira satisfy their requirements. We'll then dive a little bit deeper into the reference architecture. This way we can follow the authentication process and the subsequent authorization process with the scopes created as a part of the pool in part two of this demo. We will navigate directly to Cognito. Once we're in, we'll click the Create User Pool button, which will take us to the User Pool Creation Wizard. Here we're presented with a number of different options. Here you can select the Use Federated Identity Providers, but we'll just use a Cognito User Pool for now. For sign-in options, we will just use a username and leave the remaining options blank and click Next. Here we're presented with familiar options such as password policies, We'll just leave this as the default for now. Next we have MFA. Whilst we recommend the use of MFA for your user pool, for the purpose of this demo we'll select no MFA and leave the remaining options default and move to configure the sign-up experience. Here we can customise the sign-up experience for users. We'll also leave the defaults here whereby users will be able to self-register via the hosted UI. We'll continue through here and leave the required attributes which lets you add additional attributes as a part of the OIDC standard. Let's click next and move to configure message delivery. We're now presented with a couple of options for email delivery to users. We'll just use the email for Cognito option here as we're running a demo. We'll now hit next and move to the integrate your app section. Here we'll give our pool a username. So we'll just call this AUP Summit 22. We will then select User Cognito Hosted UI, which provides pre-built sign-up, sign-in, and OAuth2 service endpoints. We'll then need to give the Hosted UI a domain. We'll then just use the Cognito domain here. The unique domain should be available, so let's move forward. Next, we get the option to create the app client and further customize the OAuth2 options. Here we'll just create a confidential client and obtain the client ID, client secret, which will be used a little bit later in our application code. We'll give the app client a unique name for the user pool. Next we'll need to provide a callback URL, which is the unique URL for the authorization code that we'll be sent back to. We'll use a custom domain I have already prepared here and the URI OAuth2 slash IDP response Next, we will get the option to further customize the app client and select the OAuth2 grant types. We'll just leave this as the authorization code grant. Next, we can add OIDC scopes to specify the attributes this app client can retrieve for access tokens. We'll click the four main default scopes here and skip the read and write permissions to wrap up the creation of the user pool. Next, we'll review the options provided and click Create User Pool. Now we're routed back to the user pool listing where we can see the user pool we just created. Let's jump onto the user pool. Here is the default UI. Here we have the pool overview and the tabs which represent the options that we just went through as a part of the creation of the user pool. We'll jump over to the app integration section where we can see the domain that we just created as a part of the pool. At the very bottom here, we'll navigate down to our recently created app client. Here we have our app client configuration, which is still customizable. 
Next, we'll attempt to retrieve the OAuth2 compliant endpoints for our new authorization server. Firstly, we'll need the user pool ID. So we'll need to jump back into the main user pool page and copy the ID. Now we'll check the well-known configuration. Here we can see the result is returned and we can see the endpoints available, pre-authorized scopes supported and response types that are supported. Now that our user pool has been created, our app client configured and our resource server created with the appropriate permissions, let's now integrate this with the application load balancer, capture the JWT token as a part of the authorization header and pass this to our APIs during the request of the resource. Let's quickly go through the flow on how this will take place, then jump right back into the demo and show this in action. Firstly, the application client will make a request to awstechdemo.com over 443. There is an alias record as a part of this hosted zone pointing to the load balancer, which is serving traffic to incoming requests. Once a request is received, the load balancer will redirect the request to the OAuth2 slash authorized endpoint, which commences the authorization code grant flow for authentication. The user will then enter their credentials for authentication to take place. Once successfully authenticated, the authorization code is returned to the load balancer, where an access token is requested from the authorization server and subsequently returned and stored as a header in the request. The request is then routed to the resource requested, whereby an API will verify the JWT token for validity and ensure the appropriate level of permissions are available within the scopes defined. Now, let's dive deeper into the integration of the user pool with the load balancer and review the approaches taken to verify the JWT for validity and also review the scopes for the API to grant permissions to the requests. Here we're back at the user pool main page. Let's navigate to our load balancer, which has already been created under EC2. This has two target groups and two listeners for traffic, whereby 80 is just routing to force 443 traffic. Click edit slash rules on the HTTPS listener. Click the edit button again, which represents the rules for the listener. We'll create a new action on top of our forward rule to the target group, which will be to authenticate. We'll use the native integration to Amazon Cognito here, but you do get the option to use any OIDC provider. We'll next find the user pool we created and the client ID and leave the defaults under the advanced settings and hit update. Now we'll jump over to VS Code and check out the dummy routes being created which represent the APIs in Express. We have the root route which just represents the index.html page and two get operations which return a dummy response for the public and protected URI. The protected URI has an additional function call to verify JWT, which is using the AWS Labs Cognito JWT Verifier module to verify the token against the user pool via the SDK. Here we'll add the user pool ID and client ID to map to the user pool we created and test it against the scope we don't have pre-authorized, which is just the value email. We'll test this against the user, which I created earlier using the hosted UI. Once we're authenticated, we're presented with some options to access public and or protected resources. Let's try them out and see what happens. Public is returning the dummy response, but the protected is returning a, a JWT is not valid, which we expected. So let's go and adjust some custom scopes to further break this down. This is done by creating a resource server. Let's give it a name and provide a resource server identifier, which is the absolute path to the resource. We can then add custom scopes to this resource. Let's add two, one for read and one for write. We'll then head back to our app client and configure the hosted UI to adjust the pre-authorized scopes. Here we can see they're ready to go. Hit save 
and we can now adjust the load balancer configuration again. All we'll need to do is adjust the list of scopes under the advanced settings by including the full resource server identifier and the list permissions. We'll just do this with the read for now. Hit the tick and update. We'll now jump back over to VS Code and adjust the verify JWT async function. We'll just include the scopes that are required to access this API. Now, I'll need to do a git add, commit and push to deploy the change and check to see if the API is now providing access. Let's re-authenticate as we'll need to capture the new scopes from the JWT in the header as a part of the request. As you can see, the request has now returned a result and provided access to the API. This includes the encoded and decoded tokens, including the scopes that are for the user. Let's go back and observe the conversation between James and Mira now that we have demonstrated the end-to-end -end creation of the user pool integration between the load balancer and the authorization server and further restricted the access to the APIs with scopes. James and the team are now feeling confident that they can build this out and ensure that the application is secure. Thanks Mira and James for taking us through your application identity challenges today. Please see some additional resources to help solidify your understanding of Amazon Cognito and application identity. You can scan the QR codes here or note the links to take you to the blog posts which will help digest the key takeaways from today's session. To continue your cloud journey, please use these training resources. And finally, thank you so much for your time today and happy building. We really value your feedback to help us improve your sessions, so please complete the survey. Thanks.